you can manage some of the future some of the time, and you can manage all of the future some of the time, but you can't manage all of the future all of the time. It keeps breaking loose in the most unexpected fashion. The Internet is a perfect example. Here was a privileged instrument of the intelligence community and the scientific elite that served it. Uh, ultra high security, totally out of the reach of the common man. Uh, and meanwhile, over at Raytheon, they're trying to, uh, this was in, you know, years ago, they were trying to develop a chip to guide a heat seeking missile and for the Navy. And they had certain design specifications which had to be met. And the project had ground on for a couple of years, and they couldn't make this chip meet the specifications. Finally, the project was canceled. The chip is thrown in the trash. And then some engineer digs it out, and he says, you know what we could do with this? We can't hit a uh, we can't hit a plane in flight with a missile with this thing, but you know what we can do with it? We could make a, a little desktop computer with this. And these guys said, why in the hell would we want to do that? We have enormous computers. We have computers the size of a city block. Why would we want to do that? You say, no, no, you don't understand. Not for us. We have the godlike technology. It's a, it's a it's a commercial thing. We can sell it to the marks, and they can word process with it or something. So, and so it came to be. But then they didn't understand that these things, it's a, it's a pretty harmless thing, a computer sitting on a desktop with word running on it. But you sell 20 million of them, and before you realize my God, they can all be connected together. And then people just plug them in, and an entirely new beast springs into being. A technology so powerful that the head of the CIA 10 years ago didn't have that kind of access to information, that kind of access to real-time imaging, that kind of access to econometric data and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so it, it escaped. And so while they were watching various, you know, while they were keeping us from building nuclear weapons, they seemed to do that rather well. No terrorist has ever set off a thermonuclear device so far as we know. So they were watching from the ramparts for that because it was something they could understand. This thing came rushing in the back door, and now the cat is out of the bag. Yeah, it was a Scott. I'm sure that that's true. I'm sure that that's true. Uh, you know, the fact that the IRS is running on 20-year-old computers. Uh, I mean, the government is just being left behind. And the world corporate state doesn't care. It finds governments a huge and boring nuisance. You know, in the same way that after the Thirty Years' War, basically there was an enormous social shift in Europe. Before the Thirty Years' War, Europe was ruled by popes and kings. After the Thirty Years' War, it was ruled by parliaments and peoples. I mean, that's a generalization, uh, but true. Well, now the nation-state is being put out to pass. It's being told, as the church was told in the 17th century, you care for the poor. You uh, take care of the highways. You bury the dead and you educate the children. But all the stuff which makes money, we, the new streamlined form of social organization, will take care of the money-making enterprise and your job is to keep the roads cleared and the dead out of sight. Uh, and, and so this is happening. When I understood this, it was like a bolt of lightning. When Jesse Helms stood up on the floor of the U.S. Senate and called for the assassination of the American president, I realized this has become a circus. These people are yahoos. When was the last time a governor of the World Bank 
threatened the life of an American president. When was the last time that someone who sits on the board of directors of the IMF felt the need to physically threaten the life of a president? No, it doesn't happen. Real power doesn't act that way. Only pseudo-power, Yahoo power, thug power acts that way. And so government has become largely irrelevant. And I don't know whether this is good or bad. It certainly is complex. Uh, war was an instrument of national policy for governments. War is not an instrument of policy for corporations. They hate war. Uh, but uh, governments kept cultures in a deep freeze. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time lamenting the destruction of Aboriginal cultures, this rainforest tribe, that central Mexican language group, so forth and so on. But while we're lamenting the loss of these exotic cultures, notice that your culture is being erased. If, if you were you know, raised in a close-knit Jewish family, if you were raised in a small town in the Midwest, those cultures are gone for most people. We have all been given mall culture and commodification of values. It isn't only happening to the Witoto and the Huichol. It's happening everywhere. Uh, and uh, this uniformitarianism of culture is entirely for the convenience of market economy. You know, if you can get everyone drinking the same brand of vodka, it's much easier to sell and market vodka than if you have to appeal to ethnicity and local tastes and so forth and so on. So everyone, everything is being leveled, dumbed down, and uh, subjected to a hideous homogenization project uh, process. No, uh, I think people, I mean, this leads to the brink of the question about paranoia and conspiracy theory. I am very puzzled by the popularity of conspiracy theory. It seems to me it must just indicate a paranoid tendency in the population because what I see is the more you aspire to control the more frustrated and maddened you must be by the situation. So, you know, an example would be the Communist Party of the USSR. Infinite power to penetrate the lives of people, to manipulate media images. You have total control of the newspapers, total control of TV, total control, total control, and then the top guy dumps the whole thing. So uh, I, I, I think that no one is in charge and that this is a very good thing because it allows the internal dynamic of the situation to express itself. Everybody who wants to control the situation is fighting a losing battle. And if you bank with chaos, your stock just keeps growing exponentially. Uh, chaos is spreading. It's the place to put your bets. Uh, all efforts to ideologically or economically or any other way channel the global process seems to meet with incredible frustration. Uh, nobody is in charge. The, the so-called great successful conspiracies of history are so successful they don't even think of themselves as conspiracies, you know. If you've been running a given piece of turf for five or six hundred years, you don't run around in conspiratorial mode. You stride boldly across the landscape. It's yours. You own it. You think. You suppose. Oh, you mean, if only uh, Hitler were alive in Argentina calling the shots, it would all make so much more sense then. <laughs> that would explain things. <laughs> in the absence of an overarching demon like that, it's a little hard to explain things. 
I don't know. I don't feel this need for intellectual closure. I don't see why things should make sense. Uh, they never have, and they're always in process of formation. And as soon as any given goal or benchmark is achieved, it's abandoned and redefined in favor of something else. Um, no, I think conspiracy theory is uh, a very disempowering thing because what it says is you can't control the world or or it's more difficult to control the world than you think it is. Not so. I've had a very different experience. My experience with the corridors of power, if you want to put it that way, it is that there are an immense number of clueless people. It's almost like McKenna's law. It's that as you advance in social hierarchy, the percentage of smart people does not increase. So, you know, we could now, let's move to a cabinet meeting of the Clinton administration. There are as many stupid people, truly moronic people, sitting in that room as there are sitting in this room. It doesn't seem to make any difference because people don't find their seats according to intellectual or social merit. Uh, every human situation is bedeviled by morons. Uh, no matter how high you rise, you're surrounded by fools. And you're lucky if you're not one of them. I mean, that's the, the basic thing to try and guard against. Uh, and, and the other thing is, at the, at the top, it's remarkably empty. You know, you think, if you've never been there, that toward the top of the control pyramid, there must be many people standing in line, eager to take the helm, eager to make big decisions and establish their reputations and do whatever they do. Instead, what you find is fear as you go up the hierarchy. My God, if I make this decision and it goes wrong, I will lose my chairmanship or I will lose my something or other. So as you approach the, these enormously powerful levers for manipulating society, everybody's holding their hands behind their back. They don't want their fingerprints on the lever because they know, you know, that there could be war crimes trials if you stumble and get it wrong. I mean, you may have thought you were on a golden crusade. Suddenly you're looking at 12 guys in powdered wigs who think you're a jerk and they're going to hang you for the stunt you pulled. So it's like that. I used to think it was not true that all spiritual work began with oneself. You know, I felt like that was a way of disempowering people and saying, you know, if you wait until you're an avatar, you'll never join the people rioting in the street. And I used to say, you know, if you see people rioting, you have a moral obligation to join. You don't even have to know what it's about. Uh, the people rioting is a sufficient imperative to political action to be there. Well, I'm not 25 anymore. That provided a lot of fun. Uh, but I now think, uh, you know, you do not make a... Uh, a uh, unflawed contribution unless you have first gotten your ducks somewhat in order. I'm not saying you have to be able to walk on water, but you have to have at least considered your own life and, and your values and, and, and that sort of thing. You know, it's pretty simple, the ethical life. It's just demanding. Many of you have heard me say this. This is this is my uh, this is Father McKenna talking to you. <laughs> the moral life does not consist of wheatgrass diet or affirmations or any of that. The moral life is, unless you're at Esalen, you should clothe the naked, you should feed the hungry, comfort the afflicted. 
bury the dead. And there are a couple others, obvious things to be done. It's not about how many prostrations you do or what lineage you've associated yourself with or how much cholesterol is in your diet. And somehow we have confused uh, the ethical and moral dimension uh, with the dimension of physical practices probably because we have been too infected by the memes of tired Asian religions that long ago gave up moral philosophy in favor of uh, rotational activity because the social problems of Asia are overwhelming. You know, that's a, that's a, a, a response to an overwhelming human tragedy, the quietism of Asian religion, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it is still move, movement from that position. Well, and it's uh, flawed, is yeah, what you're I saying. Mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the person helped by that person is still advanced, but the whole system is not served by misguided do-gooderism or the large noblesse oblige is an insulting attitude to take because you know the real nature of the human condition is that we're all in it together this is one of the reasons why i am so hostile to all forms of spiritual hierarchy i have never seen uh, a, a truly superior person i don't believe and if i have they were so humble and self-effacing that they never would have claimed that superiority as their own. If somebody tells you they're a superior person, my God, they're automatically to be taken off the active list. That alone screws the pooch right there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's tremendously disempowering. The mushroom said to me once, and I've said it to many of you many times, it said, if for one human being to seek enlightenment from another is like a grain of sand on the beach seeking enlightenment from another. Don't you get it? It's the same flesh. It's the same flesh. Nobody knows anything you don't know, and even if they do, it's not your knowledge. So what good is it doing you? The idea that it's okay for you not to understand mathematics or not to play the violin because somebody else does it very well is a complete cop-out. You, you will be held responsible, responsible for what you know and what you can do. And using the excuse that you lived in the same world with Yasha Heifetz is not going to get you off the hook of not knowing how to play the violin. I say this as someone who does not play the violin. It, it's, it's fun to take responsibility. It's fun to test the waters. Uh, the hardest thing to put across to oneself and to other people is that the universe is a more friendly place than we have been told. Paranoia, culture is institutionalized paranoia. And it's very hard to decondition oneself from this. No matter how deconditioned you may think you are, there is more and more work to be done. And I think the essence of Taoism and why its roots in nature are so powerful is because what Taoism is saying is if you will quiet your mind and if you will pay attention, you will discover that you are supported and cared for by the dynamic of the universe. This should be obvious by virtue of the fact that you're even alive. I mean, how unlikely is your existence? I put it to you, pretty unlikely. And yet, here you are. Well, do you just think it was the greatest series of, of, of well-rolled dice in history? That's silly. That's ridiculous. Probability would never have delivered us 
to this room this afternoon. Probability sculpted by loving intent has delivered us to this room this afternoon. Once you can sense that living intent and you know, make it an object of familiarity, you probably, that is the antidote to cultural paranoia and to the acceptance of your identity through imposed definitions by other people. Uh, and of course, psychedelics figure in here because they dissolve more dramatically and more effectively than anything else the cultural and linguistic and habitual assumptions that are masking that presence of Tao. You know, it really is true, as the Bible says, you must become as a little child. It, the, that means you must become pre-culture. You must recover who you were before the engines of culture went to work on you and abused you and made you afraid and dumbed you down and distorted your values and so forth and so on. Yeah. Yeah, see, I think what's happened is at the top of the culture, it's profoundly intellectually bankrupt. There is no plan except to keep peddling stuff basically until the forests are gone and the oceans polluted and uh, it, and this is not malevolent well, it's not malevolent it's simply they are clueless they have run out of steam and so the answer is to try and keep the game going as long as possible with daytime tv with casino gambling with lotteries, with endless distractions, with pop culture fads, with cults of celebrity, with spectacular trials and gory mass murders and endless circuses, while the people at the top are saying, you know, sooner or later it, the shit is going to hit the fan. Sooner or later the dam will burst. And they say, well, let's make sure it's later, not sooner, because I've got two kids at the Sorbonne, I'm paying off a Mercedes, and I need to get this taken care of before it all falls apart. So in the absence of any cultural plan imposed from the top, this strange dynamic is happening. This is probably, this has happened before in cultural history, where some huge enterprise like Christianity or patriarchy or something like that, after playing, running its games for millennia, it just runs out of steam. And often there's nothing to rush in and fill the vacuum, nothing that is consciously engineered to do that. And so then in those situations, an actual creative bifurcation can take place because what is about to happen is not in the hands of human managers. It lies deeper in the dynamics of the whole system. And we all feel, I think, this sense of excitement and the approach of the unimaginably new. And we don't know whether it's the aliens coming to pull our chestnuts out of the fire, or virtual reality, or a new drug, or a new style of sexual behaving, or star flight. We don't know what it is, but we can feel that it will transcend the categories of our managers, and they and we will then have to make sense of whatever this new reality is. And uh, you know, it terrifies some people, it liberates others. It's the same reality. You know, Stephen Vincent Benet says something about at the end of John's Brown, John Brown's body. He says, uh, when the prophets of strange religions bawl out their bizarre despair, do not join them on the mountain. Say only then, it is here. It is here. 
because it is here. I mean, that was 1927 when he wrote that, and he spoke then of, of technology as our humble servant, already half a god. And that was in 1927. You can imagine then what that technology is today. Yeah, Mike. A manager class. I rather talk about a point in history where there is no more commodities. Yes, I don't think there will be a manager class. A manager class, you manage toward ideology. If we could transcend ideology, the way to manage society, I think, would be self-evident. The problem is trying to force it into the service of some kind of ideological vision. And then, of course, it becomes intractable because no ideological vision we've ever had has been true to our humanness. You know, the Christian version of what human beings are, the Nazi version, the Marxist version, the secular market-oriented version, these all somehow insult various parts of our humanness. And so when we're tried when an attempt is made to push us into these things, it doesn't work. And you get instead war, anxiety, and Q forces uh, swamp the social system. Uh, I think the managing of society would be fairly simple in the absence of ideology. But we're addicted to ideology because somewhere along the line we've gotten the idea that you can't understand the world without an ideology, when in fact, an ideologies are incredible impediments. No more bosses. Well, I suppose it, it, I, as long as we are disparate entities, there will be hierarchies of control. That seems obvious. But it seems as though we are playing with the idea that we may not be disparate entities, or that we may be only provisionally disparate entities. You know, we're, we are a, a peculiar creature, somewhat, and we human beings, as a, a mass phenomenon, we're somewhat like a slime mold. Uh, we have a life cycle where part of our life cycle we appear to be completely uh, separate individuals. But apparently in our, uh, if you view our development over the past few centuries, we're entering into some aggregation phase triggered by pheromones spread through technology. And we are beginning to create some kind of a superorganism. And the fear of some people is that once inside this superorganism, we will be forced into a permanent sub uh, status as a sublevel of the hierarchy. In other words, you will have to give up your individuality and you will just become a kind of liver cell or brain cell or something in this organism. But I don't think this is the case. I think we have the unique ability to combine these two modes of existence. This is why we have this notion of society and the private reality of the individual. Uh, and probably in the domain of, of uh, society, there will always be forms of, I don't want to say control, but but management of the distribution of commodities. But the idea, I think, is to empower this other dimension, to spend as much time as possible in the individual free-swimming, free-agent mode. In other words, not to see membership in society as a goal and a, and a value to be conserved, but to see it as a necessary evil. You know, we, we need social organization, but in minimal doses. And when we go on a bender of addiction to social norm, normative b 
behaviors, then you get a psychic epidemic like National Socialism, where people voluntarily, voluntarily abandon their individuality to act in concert with some kind of mass impulse. This is extremely evolutionarily retrograde. Uh, it's not what we want to do. So uh, I, I'm, I guess what I'm pleading for is an enlightened and uh, an enlightened form of alienation, and not simply an emotionally driven alienation, but a strategically driven alienation. So alienation can be used not to create neurosis, but to attain freedom. Creative alienation. Alienation that embraces itself as the source of inspiration. Nobody ever said it was going to be comfortable to be a human being and to ride one of these bipedal bodies from the cradle to the grave. I mean, it's an uncomfortable but I maintain manageable situation, but you have to have the lights on. You have to have your emotional responses in order, your intellectual responses in order. You have to have garnered some sense of how we got to this situation, and you have to have some sense of the tools available to transform it. Yeah. Well, it's certainly true that the human classroom is the most untransformed portion of society over the past 200 years. I mean, we basically still pass on our cultural values to our children the way it was done two or three hundred years ago. Uh, this may be changing. Again, I don't mean to make the Internet the panacea of all problems, but it seems to me here is a problem that the internet can address, and you don't have to be a, a technocrat to see how it has enormous power. Because education is a process, on one level, of putting correct information in front of people. And uh, in the present form of education, the great choke point is the limitations of human teachers, who, while as as finely and nobly motivated as they are, inevitably they pass on their own limitations to their students. Uh, in the presence of the internet, uh, this is somewhat mitigated. And there's a great leveling going on in the educational process. The quality of information available to all of us, if we learn how to make our way to it, is orders of magnitude more uh, uh, dependable than it was a generation ago. I mean, we have basically traded in cultural illusions for hard, hard facts. Did you want to say anything on that? Well, the, would, would you discuss the, the, the Philadelphia now not function? Well, Mick, yeah. No, McLuhan talked about this. He talked about what he called electronic feudalism. And he said uh, that, the, that the rise of electronic media would bring a retribalization of culture and that the nation state would completely disappear. And I think this is happening. It won't disappear completely, but in the metaphor I made a few minutes ago, it will sort of take on the role of the church. It's largely irrelevant. Uh, corporations now call the shots. Uh, the, uh, you, you, the print, you see, has what are called hidden biases. And it allows and, in fact, uh, uh, makes inevitable certain kinds of ideas that once you get outside the domain of print conditioning, these ideas appear, if not absurd, then at least simply provisional. And what I'm thinking of is ideas such as uh, the idea that all men, apologies to women, but all men are created equal. 
this is a face of print created society. There's absolutely no evidence that this is true. In fact, there's considerable evidence to the contrary. But the argument against not believing it is that if we don't believe this, we can't have social justice. So we must embrace an obviously preposterous idea in order to achieve social justice. Why is this preposterous idea so attractive? Well, it's because print is linear and uniform. It, it, every lowercase e looks like every other lowercase e. Therefore, if the world of print is made out of these interchangeable and equally weighted entities, so must be the society that practices print culture. So we get the idea of one man, one vote. Uh, another example, a different example, is uh, uh, assembly of objects out of interchangeable parts. Before print, if someone made an object, it was a unique object. Uh, the idea of an object, let's say a, a water wheel or something like that, where if it broke down, you got in touch with the company and they sent the part and you then took out the bad part, put in the good part, and the pump merrily proceeds. That's a print-created idea, interchangeable parts. And so we begin to see that the, 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 the conventions of the printer's shop become the conventions of an entire society and how it does its politics and how it assembles its commodities are all dictated by the invisible assumptions of a form of media that nobody really looked at its potential effects before it was put in place. Uh, McLuhan saw that uh, uh, this kind of rational, linear, compartmentalized, uh, uniformitarian culture would be completely broken up by electronics. And so it has come to pass. Uh, the, the great forms of print media are what are called uh, uh, one-to-many. A publisher publishes a book and many people read it. These one-to-many or top-down forms of media are perfect for controlling large numbers of people. You have the idea of the ministry of truth, you know, where truth is something dispensed by governments and received with grateful upturned faces by bewildered citizenry that would otherwise apparently have no access to truth. This is madness talking. Uh, the new electronic media are what's called any to any. If I want to speak to you or I want to send email to you, that can be done. If you and I want to send email to 500 people, that can be done. Uh, any to any communication is anti-hierarchical. There's no assumption of expertise or power or anything else as you ascend uh, the pyramid of information transfer and, and dispersal. And so it, it, it's almost like the Wizard of Oz effect. Suddenly people say, you know, you're not, you're not all powerful. You're not the wizard. You're a fat man in a stained overcoat uh, pulling levers uh, behind the scenes. And then the whole illusion drops away, the illusion of leaders, of privileged ideologies, of special forms of understanding. Uh, this is resisted by some people, usually control freaks, because they say, well, in the absence of these illusions, you would have chaos. Yes, indeed, indeed, the mother of all progress. Uh, 
the source of all innovation and creativity, the wind that blows the ship of paradigm shift, chaos. And the idea somehow that the human mind should interpose itself between society and this expression of chaos is just an illusion of control freaks.